All right, welcome to the QTR Podcast. Happy to have you here. Hope everybody had a lovely Valentine's Day and Valentine's Week. This podcast, like all of my podcasts, is brought to you by my patrons. Patrons are people that sign up on Patreon and donate a monthly recurring sum to help support the podcast. I'm going to shout out some of my patrons, and then we will get on our merry way today talking about just exactly how wonderful things are. Spoiler alert. They're not. All hell is breaking loose, and we'll discuss that. First and foremost, I want to shout out my exclusive gold and silver providers over at JM Bullion. I love the folks at JM Bullion. They have been in in business for over a decade. They have done over $7 billion in sales. They are the only place that I buy my gold and silver bullion from. They have incredible inventory. They always ship discreetly, and I am so happy to have them as supporters and patrons of the podcast. They have been supporting me for years and so when it comes time to check out gold and silver bullion make sure you check out jm bullion first qtr podcast listeners have their own salesperson at jm bullion if you would like it if not you're more than happy to just go on the website but if you want some personalized service you can email laura l-a-u-r-a at jm bullion.com and laura would be happy to walk you through the process help you out talk to you about inventory talk to you about pricing talk to you about shipping, and generally just make sure that you get taken care of. So I want to shout out Laura because she has been awesome to my podcast listeners in the past. And uh, if you're looking for gold and silver bullion, like, uh, I don't know, maybe you're the Chinese Central Bank, <laughs> little uh, geopolitical chaos, little World War Three humor for you there, which we'll get into, check out JM Bullion. Link is in my podcast description. This podcast also brought to you by my dear friend Sang Lucci. And Wall Street Jesus over at the Steam Room. The Steam Room is an incredible piece of software that helps you track flow in the illiquid options market, which many times can telegraph moves in the equities market. And by the way, the options market isn't as illiquid as it was when I first started shouting out Sang Lucci, you know, three, four years ago. The options market pretty much is the tail that wags the dog right now. So that's why the options market is arguably even more important than the equities market at this point. Because many times equity moves are just reacting to what the option market is doing. The Steam Room is a wonderful piece of software and a wonderful trading community that will give you insight as to what is going on and where the money is landing in the options market, which is important, uh, if you, uh, especially if you're an active trader and if you follow the markets. It's also a great community of people that I know and trust. I love Sang Lucci. He will be back on the podcast soon. Just spoke to him a couple days ago. We're talking about perhaps doing a little meet and greet in Philadelphia together at some point relatively soon. Reach out to Lucci. Tell him the Q-Man sent you. Tell him you want a free trial. Tell him you want to try the software. Tell him you want whatever you want, and he will make sure that you get taken care of. His links are in my podcast description. Check out the Steam Room. This podcast also brought to you by my friend George Gammon over at Rebel Capitalist Pro. George has teamed up with Lynn Alden, Chris McIntosh, Brent Johnson, and a whole host of other people who have IQs much larger than mine to help you figure out How to preserve your wealth in a world of -of out-of-control central banks where basically rule number one in the Keynesian playbook is to tax people via inflation because they don't understand it. And so George is tackling that problem, trying to talk about exactly how bad the system is and invest accordingly. If you look at things through an Austrian lens, through a skeptical lens, George is a great person to follow because his forums are resourceful and they're useful, especially if you're a trader, if you're an investor. I love following Lynn Alden's mock portfolios. I love reading the discourse, although I don't write on the forum that much anymore, but I do read the forum uh, quite a bit. And I find it very useful. George also does multiple live question and answer sessions with experts like Brent Johnson. So you can get your questions in. You can ask them whatever you want. Uh, And it's uh, it's a great bargain, just like the steam room. I mean, it's relatively modestly priced. And hopefully it's one of those things where you can get your value uh, from, uh, you know, and make it well worth the cost of admission. You know, you buy gold and silver because you think it'll go up. You check out the options market because you want some insight that the regular market won't give you. You check out George Gammon because you want to make sure you protect what you already have. All these things make sense. And you listen to me because you're having a fit of bad judgment and it doesn't cost anything. (laughs) 
<laughs> this podcast also brought to you by my blog, Fringe Finance. The link to that is in my podcast description. I publish almost daily on Fringe Finance. Talk about my personal portfolio, where I am allocated, what I think, and I also curate content from people that I know, trust, and agree with content that I find useful and valuable. I always pass that along as well. So the link to that is also in my podcast description. This podcast has a three drink minimum and I am not an investment advisor. I'm not an investment strategist. I hold no licenses, no registrations. I have no SEC anything. I have no FINRA anything. I'm not registered. And this is not a solicitation to buy or sell securities. Obviously, I generally don't have much of a clue as to what I'm talking about. Please do not follow my advice. I'm not a doctor. I just play one on TV. Do not do what I do. Otherwise, you will wind up uh, living in a 400-square-foot apartment and driving a car that is badly in need of a passenger side mirror, uh, the wonderful life that I am leading. All right, with all that being said, what do we want to talk about today? You know, last week or two weeks ago or whenever it was, I watched the State of the Union address And I do have to give Biden some credit because he sounded the most spry he has sounded in a long time. He stuttered much less than he has in other public appearances. And he generally looked like he had his shit together. It reminded me of, well, of course, minus the content of what he said. (laughs) But it looked like he looked in that first debate. Um against Trump. It looked like somebody had hopped him up on amphetamines and he was with it. And so I'll give him credit for that. I'll give him credit for delivering his message powerfully and actually, you know, being a good orator. Um, But for the small fact that I agreed with very little of what he said. And as I sat and I watched him say, the state of the union is strong. I couldn't help but think, no, it isn't. So, thus was born my idea to offer my response. And by the way, you know, I I think that the response to the State of the Union in general is just stupid. I think when they do this Democratic response or Republican response, it's just like, all right, like, we get it. Basically... The response to the State of the Union could be that scene in My Cousin Vinny where he gets up and he's like, hey, everything that guy just said is bullshit. And then, <laughs> and then sits back down. Because regardless of whether or not it is bullshit, that's what the other side is going to claim, no doubt. So if Trump was up there, the Democratic response is, you know, this guy's full of shit. And of course, the same with Joe Biden speaking. Um You know, something I write about a lot on my blog that I don't really talk too much about on the podcast is the state of the union in general and kind of where I see things, where we're at right now as a country. And whether or not this chapter we're going to enter here as a country is going to be different than things have been over the last 10, 20, 30, 40 years. Now, granted, look, I'm only 40 years old, so I have a small window. You know, I've only been paying attention to current events and to politics and to finance for, I don't know, 10 or 15 years. And so the first thing that I constantly am thinking is whether or not there really is a drastic material shift taking place or whether or not it is my limited scope of understanding uh, that is working against me. And that, you know, everything is going to continue to turn out fine because everything has always turned out fine. It's like these people that are in the world of finance, these kids that are 30 years old and 32 years old working at brokerage jobs that think that the market just doesn't go down and that there's no depressions and there's no crises and there's no bear markets because they've never lived through one. You know, they, they didn't live through 1929, so they have no idea exactly how bad things could be. You know, you ever laugh at your grandmother because she's walking down the street and she sees a penny and she picks it up and you're like, what's the point of even bending down to pick that up? Well, she'll tell you because she lived through 1929 and even though a penny is worthless, it's not worth the copper it's printed on or the bronze or the plastic or the fiberglass or whatever they're using to make coins at this point. We've we've devolved. It's sure, I, surely it's not copper anymore. 
But uh, I think it's bronze. I don't know what pennies are made out of. Peter Schiff would know. But, uh, you know, you'd be saying, look, there's no point even picking it up. Like, it's worthless. Don't even bend down, you know? But your grandmother lived through 1929. You know, first of all, back then, a penny was enough to buy a palace. So inflation has ended that, of course. But it was the frugality, the mindset. Underconsumption, spending less that you have, you know, cutting all the corners possible in order to save. And we just don't have that mindset anymore. And it has been a product of decades of monetary policy that has enforced a lot of behavioral norms that, in my opinion, contradict directly with the laws of economics, the tried and true gritty meat and potatoes laws of economics like supply and demand like you you know that productivity comes from savings and capital investment and not spending uh and you know just the entire austrian slate of beliefs versus the keynesian slate of beliefs which is that spending is the virtue uh, there's no need to save, and the economy is healthy as long as people are spending, and it doesn't really matter where the spending is coming from, which is what we're watching right now. The market is up, uh, definitely higher than it should be, with rates at 5%, because American consumers continue to find a way to spend. Nobody really cares about the fact that we're racking up record levels of debt, not only on a national, you know, state and municipal level, but also individuals are racking up a significant amount of debt and credit cards are being stretched to the max. And so that is where the spending is coming from, but nobody really cares about that. They're just, you know, it's like the jobs report. Oh, we added 500,000 jobs. Does it matter that, you know, these came from 100,000 uh, people who are working four jobs each, all earning $3 an hour as Uber Eats drivers? No, that doesn't matter because the number looks good. It's like what they're doing now with this super core inflation. Just take out whatever CPI components you don't like and call it something else. And by the way, two quarters of negative GDP growth is no longer a recession. So this is the kind of stuff that we're doing. And it's just, it's a fool's errand. We're performing an ungodly amount of mental gymnastics to try to, I don't know if it's convinced the public or if it's convinced ourselves if the politicians and the Treasury Secretary and the you know Fed Chair are trying to convince themselves that everything's okay, uh, or if they're just trying to keep up appearances, and it doesn't really matter because under the surface, the actual data and the reality of the situation are proving to uh, be a much different scenario, and in my opinion, are going to play out uh, at some point. They have to. As Ron Paul says, the, the free market kind of always has the last word, and that's what I think is going to be the case. I don't think we're going to be some grand exception. On top of that, we have all of these catalysts that are pushing us closer towards that in a quicker fashion uh, than we would normally expect, and, and I'll review those as well. I mean, first, when you talk about the State of the Union, let's just take a look at the country. And again, I'm going to give you anecdotal um, data from my own personal experience, but that is what it is. You know, U.S. cities, in my opinion, are just disintegrating before our eyes. Not all of them. Three cities that I have gone to regularly in the U.S. enough for me to feel like I can get a gauge on how they have progressed or regressed over the last couple of years are Philadelphia, New York City, and San Francisco. Um, you know, I've said on the podcast before, I would go to San Francisco every year uh, during the summer, and I literally watched the city degrade over the course of five years. And I mean, I know COVID had a lot to do with it, or our reaction to COVID, should I say. But I watched the city go from a bustling, you know, touristy kind of uh, hotspot to a complete hellscape in the span of just three or four years. I mean, I was there, I think, in 2018, 2019, and then 2021. And I think the gap between 2019 and 2021 was the starkest because the entire uh, area of the city where I would normally go to run through, and that's kind of how I know 
these cities and kind of, I guess, how I would take inventory is I run a lot. I'll run, you know, 25 to 35 miles a week. And so when I'm visiting cities, I find new areas to run and I just kind of take inventory of what's going on and take a look. But in San Francisco, when I first started going there in 2016, I think, or 2017, you know, I enjoyed it. I really liked it. I liked going and sitting and eating out by the bay, and I thought that the uh, innards of the city were nice enough, and there was plenty of, you know, retail open and plenty of tourists, and, you know, you had the cable cars going up and down the streets, and I loved running the hills, um, and it was just generally pretty nice. I was pretty impressed by it the first time I went there. And when I went back in 2021, it had devolved into a complete hellscape. And I I mean, the areas where stores used to be open, the retail areas, um, you know, where the Gap flagship store used to be. And I forget what street that is, but they do the the uh, the trolley car rides up that hill there. I forget what it's called. But if you know San Francisco, you know where I'm talking about all shut down. You know, that used to be an area where. I couldn't figure out which restaurant I wanted to go to because there were so many places that I wanted to try out. Um, And I couldn't figure out where I wanted to shop because there were so many places to go and check out. You know, and when I went back in 2021, it was just everywhere in the surrounding area, too. The shops were boarded up. Places were closed. It looked like the city was abandoned. There were no tourists. That Gap store had closed down completely. And then I wound up going for a walk with a friend of mine. Uh, And I think we were just basically going for a walk around town. I think we were looking for somewhere to eat. And we wound up stumbling on, it must have been the Flatiron area, I think it's called, um, where it's just streets and streets and streets of tents and homeless people. And look, I'm not... um, I'm not taken back by the sight of homeless people. I'm not, you know, I've lived in a, in a major city for the last 20 years, uh, longer than that, I think. And, you know, I've, it's not something that's stunning to me. You know, I've lived in all parts of Philadelphia. I've seen all different, you know, I've traveled to all different parts of the city. I understand how bad it looks at Kensington and Allegheny right now. I know what it looks like at Center City. I know what it looks like at Germantown. I know what it looks like in South Philly. I spent time in New Orleans after Katrina. It's not like I haven't been places and seen devastating areas. And I have to say what we saw in San Francisco was something like I had never seen before. And uh, it was one of the first times where I and I don't normally feel threatened uh, walking around dangerous areas, too, to be honest with you. I don't know. You know, I'm 6'2", 200 pounds. Uh, I, I don't really worry about those types of things. It's I don't, you know, obviously you want to be street smart and you don't want to be out there waving a wad of $100 bills with a giant sign around your neck that says, shoot me and take my money. But having said that, I, I don't normally worry about those things. And when I got into that area, I said to my friend, I said, you know, let's go left here. Let's get the fuck out of this area. And I was stunned, you know, even in the walk back to the hotel that I stayed at, which was a fairly nice hotel um, in a relatively decent area. But even in the walk back, uh, I was just, uh, you know, just stunned and appalled at really what what the city had become and wondering how, you, you know, we're downtown in an area with uh, all of the major buildings and, uh, you know, all the restaurants and uh, all the uh, giant office buildings with major corporations that have headquarters there. And I'm just wondering, like, how do fucking people live here? How do people live here and go to work during the day? How do people walk through this? How do people see this? I mean, I wouldn't want to see that. Uh, you know, it's not it's not because I'm a, I'm offended by it or anything. It's just not, you know, I definitely wouldn't want to raise a family in, an, in a U.S. city right now. I could tell you that if I was married and had kids... I would want to get the fuck out of the city. I would be moving to a plot in the uh, in a rural area with a large tract of land uh, and a place where I could shack away and uh, keep myself protected and insulated and isolated because the, the cities are just, they're just devolving. And when you look at the crime statistics of places like New York City and you look at the crime statistics of places like Chicago, and then you have people like Nancy Pelosi and Lori Lightfoot, you know, celebrating 
uh, their achievements. You know, Gavin Newsom celebrating his achievements in California. Half the state is leaving to go to Florida, to go to Texas, to go anywhere else. You know, fucking Omaha. Who cares? Just get out. Um, It just kind of shows that there is a large portion of the country that is operating under a, a delusion of just how, you know, well things are going. It's not just financially. It's the state of our country in general. What's baffling to me, and we'll talk about this when we talk about finances, the idea that we can print all this money and rack up all this debt and ship all this money overseas like we're doing, and the country is falling apart here. You know, we have ample... We have ample cash to right the ship here in the U.S., but we're not doing it. Um, And, you know, look, I don't know if it's just having a better understanding of how the system works now at 40 years old or or whether it's always been like this or whether things really are getting worse. Uh, And maybe somebody that's older than me can tell me, go onto my blog and leave me a comment. You know, has it has it always been like this? And maybe I'm just catching up to the reality of what happens. I don't know. You know, um, I know that. But I know that the delusion of politicians doesn't quite irk me as much as the hypocrisy. And, you know, these are the things like we saw during COVID when politicians would get up and preach and say that they know what's best for us and then go and do the opposite. And those types of things... I think really go to show you whose best interest politicians have in mind. Because when Gavin Newsom says stay home and then he goes out to a fancy dinner, or when Nancy Pelosi says stay home and close all shops, but then she goes to get her hair done, you know, there's something very, very wrong there. You have to eat your own cooking as a politician, you know. When you when you do the opposite of what you're trying to legislate, it just doesn't make any sense. When you want to ban guns, but you want to be protected by armed security, and then you laugh at people who make the argument that they want to own guns for their own protection, that just doesn't make sense to me. When you have people essentially take over a city like they did in 2021, I think it was, after the George Floyd protests, and they created that autonomous zone in Seattle... And you had business owners and residents in downtown Seattle whose lives were impacted and probably ruined. Businesses burnt to the ground and, you know, customer flow impeded. Uh, And you had the mayor saying, oh, this is okay. We're going to let this go. And then all of a sudden, once everybody showed up at the mayor's house, it was like, all right, uh, we got to we got to get a hold on this. We got to shut it down. That kind of stuff is the worst because You know, it's like the CEO of a company. Do you want him to own stock in the company if you're a stockholder? Of course you do, because you want his or her interests to be aligned with the shareholders. You don't want him to be selling while other people are buying. That's a bad sign. And essentially, that's what politicians have been doing. They've been selling while telling the investing public, their constituents, the country, to keep buying their bullshit. Meanwhile, what they say and what they do have been starkly different from one another. And that's the kind of disingenuous, you can say what you want about a lot of Republicans, but you know when you're calling for personal responsibility and less regulation in general, and advocating for personal liberty, and you disagree with what some Republicans are doing in their personal lives, and I don't know what, what that might be, but let's just say you know, Ted Cruz, whatever, goes hunting and and you don't like it because you're an animal rights advocate. Well, at least that falls in the purview of, of, you know, being free and liberty, which is what he's advocating for, right? And, And so at least they're somewhat eating their own cooking. Whereas with Democrats, it, it seems like oftentimes they do the opposite of what it is that they are advocating for. And I think that's infuriating. And, you know, look, I'm sure there's Republicans that do it also. I I don't want to be partisan about this. I think that there, I'll give you a good example, was Trump who ran on the idea that the economy was in a bubble and that Janet Yellen was doing the wrong thing. And then as soon as he became elected president, decided he wanted to perpetuate the bubble and wanted rates to go to zero or to go negative. 
Um, you know, and it's that kind of decision making that I'm sure helped fan the flames of the inflationary crisis that we're having. And so people don't like being lied to, and they certainly don't like witnessing hypocrisy from politicians. On top of that, and outside of the world of finance, the, the state of the country just seems to be moving in the wrong direction. I mean, if you walk out your door, here's an experiment. Do this today, especially if you live in a city. If you walk out your door and you just take a glance down a sidewalk where people are walking, you know, how many of those people have headphones on? And by the way, I'm guilty of this myself because I don't leave the house without, you know, headphones on and music playing and my phone in my hand. But how many people are walking around with headphones in their ears? And this is especially true in the city and with their eyes on their phone. And it seems like almost everybody. I know for certain the other day I was counting people going by where I live and like 75% of them have had headphones in. And so what's going on, right? You're being desensitized to the world around you. Slowly but surely with each generation, with each, you know, and as we move towards augmented reality and virtual reality, this is going to continue and it's going to get worse. And as we get more devices, this will continue and it's going to get worse. But we're kind of just taking a step away from being present as human beings in general. And I find that alarming too. And we have a major growing fentanyl crisis in the country that the president talked about, yet he doesn't seem to want to act on by closing the borders, as was heard in the State of the Union. And by the way, I don't support screaming out in the middle of the State of the Union, no matter how much you disagree with the president. Let him say what he's got to say, then put it in the Republican response. You know, here's a very concerned Sarah Huckabee Sanders to deliver the Republican response. Fuck you. There's a Republican response. There's my response to both of you, both parties. Chris Irons is now delivering his his independent response for the on behalf of the Libertarian Party. Hello, fuck you. Thank you and good night. <laughs> but let's just look at the reality of the situation. I mean, go up to Kensington and Allegheny here in Philadelphia. It is horrifying. I don't really know how else to describe it. Uh, it's absolutely horrifying. And if you don't believe me, you can look it up on YouTube. Look at, you know, Philadelphia zombie streets or search for Kensington on YouTube. Take a look at what Northeast Philly has become thanks to the fentanyl and drug epidemic. And by the way, you don't even have to go there if you live down in Center City or you live in South Philly or you live in Northern Liberties or you live in Brewery Town. You're seeing it trickle down towards the center of the city. So it's just a matter of time before Philadelphia starts to look like San Francisco. Um, it's already significantly worse than it was 10 years ago. Uh, and I know just from witnessing it, uh, you know, it's it's just, it's significantly worse. But ride, you can't even ride the subway in Philadelphia because there are people constantly dipping out, starting fights, shooting up, smoking pot. I mean, the subways are just absolutely out of control. In this city, and I imagine I don't ride the subway in New York often, but I imagine it's the same in New York, and uh, and I imagine it's the same in San Francisco as well. And so, you know, between keeping our eyes on our phone all the time and keeping our headphones in and allowing these drugs to just kind of infiltrate the country with no real plan or repercussions, it doesn't look like to try to stop it, other than the left's plan which appears to be give people safe sites to continue doing fentanyl and heroin. And I'm not a mental health or drug expert, and I don't claim to be, but this just doesn't seem like the right idea to me. Uh, you know, I feel like a lot of times people on the left overthink things. And sometimes things don't need to be overthought. Sometimes the solution to stopping the drug problem is stopping the drugs and not, you know, providing... Uh, homeless shelters where people can continue to shoot up and providing needles for people to do that. I mean, th there's a fine line there between uh, advocating for mental health and a really continuing the problem or making the problem worse. Uh, and I think that a lot of times we overthink these things and we just need to 
think. Sometimes the simplest solution is the best solution. That's oftentimes. But you don't, in a, in a postmodern world, right, run by intellectuals, uh, that just won't suffice because intellectuals and academia, they need to keep their, uh, keep their grift going to some degree. It's like this other idea, and here's another thing to talk about when we talk about the State of the Union, is that just people are just getting fatter. You know, I, I, I don't know what to say. I don't have any beef with fat people. I have fat friends. I love fat people, you know, just like I love skinny people. I'm not prejudiced. I have no stereotypes. But the idea that being fat is healthy is just wrong. And so the people that are advocating for, you know, what they call body positivity. Look, there's nothing wrong with loving who you are. There's nothing wrong with loving how you look if you're fat or are you're skinny. But if you're fat, you should aspire to get into shape. You should aspire to lose weight. You should aspire to make yourself healthy. And this isn't fucking rocket science. It's false. I mean, again, talk about overthinking the problem. You know, if you're out of shape, go get blood work done. Get a lipid panel run. See how it comes back. See what your blood pressure is. See what your doctor tells you. They're going to tell you, eat less. Eat more fruits and vegetables. Eat, you know, a whole food uh, plant-based diet. They're going to say, uh, you know, drop drop X amount of pounds. I mean, look, I, I was never, like, re- severely overweight. But at one point when I went in to get my blood pressure checked many years ago, probably at my heaviest that I've ever been, uh, the doctor said, hey, you know, if you lose 5, 10 pounds, your heart doesn't need to work as hard. And so your blood pressure will come down a little bit. And I thought, oh, okay. You know, I could do that. And so I did. And so, you know, I've kept most of the weight off since then. But, you know, hey, s- cause and effect. Simple solution, simple, uh, sorry, simple problem, simple solution, right? This is like supply and demand, the basics of economics, under consumption, you know, to help build savings. Spending does not help you build savings. Simple, super simple concepts that we have just fucked beyond repair. Because we can't stop thinking about thinking about thinking about thinking about thinking, right? Not everything is a fucking uh, postmodern, uh, you know, Michel Foucault uh, pretzel that needs to be twisted and then untwisted and then twisted up again. You know, sometimes the solution is just lose weight. <laughs> you know, nobody wants to hear it because it's not the easy thing to do. Right? Nobody wants to eat a fucking carrot when they can eat an Oreo. Trust me. I, dude, I eat M&M peanuts every day. Okay? I'll be the first person to admit it. You know, but I also work out and I try to watch what I eat. I don't eat 12 gallons of them a day and then sit at home and do nothing for 16 hours. I try to be active and I try to moderate what I eat. Right? And I'm not a shining example. I think I'm still even a little overweight for my uh, age and for my height. But, but the point is... Cause and effect, right? It's not easy to fucking lose weight, which is why nobody wants to do it, which is why this idea that, you know, being obese is healthy and is okay is so appealing to so many people. It's the same reason that the Keynesian charade appeals to people because people can walk around and say everything's fine and I'm fine when things aren't fine and they're not fine. George Gammon posted this video on Twitter the the other day of high school fitness in the year 1962, and it's a video of high school students, uh, you know, doing the monkey bars, uh, climbing the rope. You know, these kids are all. Did you ever just? By the way, forget about this. And George says, "Look, I know it's controversial to say, but humans aren't meant to be a hundred plus pounds overweight." You know, I don't know why that's controversial to say. Even people on the left, even Bill Maher talks about this all the time. I mean, Bill Maher's a vegetarian. He stays in relatively good shape. You know, he talks about this all the time. You know, being fat is not being healthy. I'm sorry. You know, look, genetics do play a role in it. And you want to be confident and comfortable with who you are. But it doesn't mean that if you're unhealthy, you shouldn't strive to be healthier. You know, I strive to drink less. I strive to stay in decent shape, you know? 
I don't know if it'll change things for me. Maybe I, maybe I'll get hit by a bus one day while I'm out for a 10 mile run. You know, that would be the ultimate fucking irony. Who cares? But but the message should be to strive for better. It shouldn't be complacency. And that's the message, complacency. And not only that, but really celebrating. Celebrating being out of shape. Celebrating uh, being fat. And just to go back to the gammon thing for a second, you don't even have to look at his Twitter. Just Google a photograph of people at the beach in the year 1955, 1960. Just take a look. You know, some old black and white photo. Guys are fucking wearing Speedos. Everybody <clears throat> is thin. Everybody's in shape. You know, the deal was you ate fucking three squares a day. You know, you had your protein, you had your side of vegetables. And that was it. At night, you know, you would smoke a cigar or a cigarette. You would drink your scotch. You'd have a cup of coffee at night. You know, you marched march along to the factory in the morning with your thermos and your lunchbox and a bologna sandwich. And, you know... Bologna's not the greatest thing in the world. It's a carcinogen, actually. (laughs) But the deal was when you ate lunch on the factory line, when when the horn blew and everybody sat down together and ate their lunch, you know, you had your thermos, you had your bologna sandwich, and you had your apple or your fucking side dish or whatever, and you ate it, and that was that. Nobody was going to Taco Bell and getting the fucking extra big ass fries and the extra big ass taco or the extra big ass burrito or a combo meal now i mean if you go the the horrifying thing is when you when you think about what a bologna sandwich is right you probably let's just say you got like two or three slices of bologna you got a slice of cheese and two pieces of white bread and maybe a little bit of mayonnaise, you're talking probably, I don't know, 600 calories, I would say. Each piece of white bread is about 100 calories. You figure a slice of Kraft Singles is 110 calories, I think. So, you, so you're up to 310, plus the bologna probably brings you to 4 or 450, and a nice big slathering of mayonnaise probably brings you to 600, right? So, <clears throat> you know, your main course at lunch was a 600-calorie bologna sandwich. Sure, you were eating a carcinogen, but you were only eating 600 calories of carcinogen. (laughs) Now, what do you do? You go to McDonald's. The horrifying thing is you look at the calories that these things put up on the board because now, you know, new rules make it so that these fast food joints have to put their nutrition facts right on the board. I mean, if you get something like a Big Mac meal with like the fries and the Big Mac without the drink, I think, You know, you're talking 1,500, 1,600 calories. If you add in like a 32-ounce Coca-Cola, you're pushing 2,000 calories just on a meal. And this is just commonplace. And it's not just, you know, where the shit is really sneaky is when you go to like a Chili's or you go to an Applebee's or you go to a TGI Friday's or you go to a Panera. You know, people think that food is healthy uh, or they at least think that it's home-cooked, homegrown food. It's not. You know, anybody that's been on the delivering end in the back room of a restaurant that gets the delivery from U.S. Foods or from Cisco uh, and has looked at the nutrition facts that are on the actual boxes that they deliver to these places before they take the frozen food laden with preservatives and throw it on the grill and prep it for your plate uh, would be horrified. You know, something I remember when I was a young kid, I worked at a TGI Friday's and I remember looking at the nutrition facts on a brownie dessert there was like a a fudge brownie dessert I forget what it was called but uh you know it was insane it was like 200 percent of your daily sugar intake in one serving you know 2500 calories or something I was like holy shit you know and that wasn't on the menu and nobody knew about that so you go out to a place like that and you get an appetizer and you get a meal and you get a dessert and you have a coffee and you have one margarita and you think okay this is a complete dinner and you've just consumed 3,500 calories. And if you're not doing anything athletic for the day, that's basically, you know, probably like three quarters or, or, or a pound or a pound and a quarter that you're just adding in body weight just, just in one day from one meal. It doesn't even include breakfast and lunch. And if you're like most Americans, you get your breakfast at Wawa and you get your lunch at, you know, McDonald's and you get your dinner at the pizza shop or whatever. I mean, you're pushing 5,000 calories a day. Uh, but the problem is the whole nation is depressed and food gives you a little hit of dopamine. And so, uh, you know, it becomes a, an ugly self-fulfilling prophecy. Before you know it, you got a nation full of fat people that can't do the monkey bars anymore. And you have fat people telling other fat people that being fat is healthy. 
Uh, look, no problem with body positivity. I have a lot of friends that are overweight. I think they're great people. Some of my favorite people in the world are overweight. But it doesn't mean that it's healthy. You know, and so there's a line to draw there. You should strive to do better. So we have a nation of fat, drug addicted uh, people in cities that are disintegrating with their headphones on and their face in their phone that can't see right in front of them. You know, the, the other thing, too, and by the way, I'm guilty of this also. So I'd say these things up front. But is this thing with sports gambling now? I mean, people can't even enjoy. And it's the same with the gamification of the stock market. You know, the stock market used to just be investing. Buy and hold, buy this shit, leave it here, collect the dividends, reinvest them, and go about your life. Now it's an all-day, everyday affair. You watch what's going on from the time you wake up to the time you go to bed. And by the way, I'm guilty of this. I've lost money doing this. You know, so I'm I'm speaking a little bit from personal experience, but also in generalities. That that is a terrible way to go about things. You have to distance yourself from. You know, there's a there's a healthy kind of removal from these things that we're 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 not engaging in anymore. And it's the same with sports, right? You know, it was okay. You bet on the Super Bowl, you get a couple of squares. Hey, one game a year, Ace Ventura, right? Of course, there's bets being made. It's the Super Bowl. But do you need to be betting on Latvian ping pong at nine o'clock in the morning? No. So we've got a nation of sports gambling addicted, drug addicted, fat people with their headphones on and their eyes in their phone bumping into each other as they walk on the street. And, uh, and you know, Biden's upstairs saying the state of the union is strong. And maybe I'm just a pessimist, but I don't really see it. And there's no more <clears throat> glaring area that it is evident to me that the state of the union is not strong than in finance. And also, we can talk about geopolitics. They go kind of hand in hand. But the idea that we are not in a financially precarious position is absurd. You know, keeping with the theme of doing whatever we want and telling ourselves that it's okay, that it's the path to prosperity when it's just the opposite. It's the path to, you know, head to... uh, instant doom. (laughs) All right, that's a little morbid, but it it, it certainly isn't the path to prosperity. And this is, you know, look, this isn't going to be partisan commentary here because Republicans are guilty of this in the same exact way that Democrats are. So this is not a, it's not a dig at Joe Biden. It's just a dig at people that can't grasp reality. But look, in the fifties, in the sixties, you know, this country had true grit We went to war, like I was saying, in 62, guys were fucking doing the monkey bars. You know, now monkey bars are a microaggression. Okay. The country had some grit to it. You know, we went through World War I, we went through World War II, and then we had this giant boom when everybody returned to the country because we had production here, we had people saving, we had people willing to work, we had sound money, meaning that we couldn't print money and print our way out of uh, problems like we do now. And, uh, <clears throat> you know, we had home ownership. We had people starting families. Uh, life was good. And we were certainly on a path to prosperity then. Then, you know, all of a sudden we came off the gold standard and in the 70s and the 80s started to dabble down this path of Uh, The U.S. dollar is the global reserve currency, and so we can kind of do whatever we want. And first we started heading down that path slowly, and then we started heading down it quicker. And, you know, the latest uh, exemplification of this is what we did during COVID, where we shut down the entire economy and replaced it with a money printer, the effects of which we're feeling right now with inflation. Um, And so, you know, how do do you go from, uh, you know, having gold-backed currency to kind of devaluing the currency a little bit from gold to 40 years later, all of a sudden we're just going to print as much money as we want. We have $9 trillion on the Fed's balance sheet, $31, $32, $33 trillion in debt, uh, and 5% interest rates, and we're arguing over uh, whether or not we should be raising the debt ceiling, which of course was put into place for a reason. 
You know, the debt ceiling was put into place to prevent us from taking on burdensome amounts of debt, to keep checks and balances on the government with how it spends. And we're doing the total opposite of that now. So in essence, we are uh, telling the uh, the fat pile of debt that it is uh, that it's healthy also, too, is basically what we're doing. We're saying thirty two trillion dollars in debt is not a problem. I love when Janet Yellen says last week, well, the U.S. has met all of its obligations since 1789. And we don't plan on not doing so going forward. It's like, guess what? It's not going to be our fucking choice when nobody takes the U.S. dollar anymore. And I don't want to sound morbid, and I don't want to sound like a conspiracy theorist, and I don't want to sound like somebody on the fringe. I just want to sound like common sense, right? Over the last 30 or 40 years, the stock market has gone up, and the nation has survived, even though productivity in the country has dwindled, and we have these massive trade deficits— because we've been able to export dollars. We've been able to take dollars and use them uh, overseas to buy the things that we want to support our quality of life because there is always demand for dollars, uh, especially from nations that do a lot of the production, like China, for instance, like India, for instance. And slowly but steadily over the last 30 or 40 years, we've outsourced pretty much everything to the point where, again, the only thing that we export from our country is U.S. dollars. Again, we saw the lack of productive capacity in the country when during COVID we were trying to manufacture certain pharmaceuticals that we were going to use to try to combat COVID and we needed ingredients from China. And so we couldn't do it because we couldn't get <clears throat> the ingredients that we needed to make them from China. Uh, that is a country that has been gutted and is now reliant on the rest of the world to help it supply itself with what it needs to maintain its quality of life. While we've been kind of losing our productive capacity, we have been uh, pushing it, let's just say, further and further with keeping the dollar as global reserve currency. You know, we've been emboldened over the last 30 years or 40 years to think that we can really do no wrong, that we can run up debt and it's not going to matter, and that we can police and tell the rest of the world what to do um, because we wield such influence, um, and really much of that influence comes from the dollar being accepted on the global stage. Because without trading partners and without the dollar, we would suffer a huge drop-off in our quality of life and a huge uh, drop-off in our ability to continue to fund uh, all of the things that we fund, not just our domestic uh, programs, but also the money that we ship overseas. Um, and so, <clears throat> you know, all of this has been reliant on the idea that the dollar is going to be the world's global reserve currency for the foreseeable future. And so we've played this game over the last few decades where we kind of just elbow our way through. This reminds me of when I was in Italy. I was at Ponte Vecchio in Florence and, you know, it's a it's a beautiful area in Florence. There were a lot of tourists around, many people from all over Europe visiting, taking pictures. And uh, there was an American guy who just kind of like was elbowing people out of the way uh, in order to get his photo while other people were politely waiting in line to take their photo. And it reminds me of that, you know, that ethos, that American uh, kind of and and I go I leave the country once in a while and I talk to people about this outside of the country how Americans are viewed and how we act when we're not in the United States and it's a microcosm of that there's no modesty there's no humbleness there's no humility it's we're going to elbow our way into wherever the fuck we think we deserve to be and our influence is going to be more important than anybody else's because we're Americans and I know that that's kind of a stereotype but I think it's, like many stereotypes, it's a stereotype for a reason. It's a stereotype because that shit actually happens. Not everybody is like that, but there are a fair amount of people like that. And so that is kind of what we have done. We have stuck our nose into the affairs of the rest of the world and uh, really feel like uh, we are kind of leading. Uh, we feel like we're blazing the path forward for all of humanity, despite the fact that uh, there are other sovereign nation states out there, uh, and I guess we haven't really considered it, but, you know, some of them are not really fucking interested in what we have to say. <laughs> and yes, we have a 
we have a robust military and we have a great history and track record uh, in the country. But that is veering off the path now because instead of being humble and trying to preserve that and understanding the sanctity of that and the, you know, the brand equity that it gives uh, the United States, uh, we've chosen to just kind of overdo it and, and, and abuse that uh, like a guy that doesn't know when to stop drinking at the bar. And so, <clears throat> you know, the latest kind of straw that broke the camel's back was when we seized all of these FX reserves from Russia after they went in and invaded Ukraine, you know, and, and regardless of how you feel about that, uh, about Russia invading Ukraine and war is hell. I don't want war ever. End of story. Full stop. But regardless of how you feel about what happened, uh, the idea that we were just going to unilaterally make the decision that Russia wasn't justified in doing what they did uh, probably was agitating to Russia and I'm sure was agitating to a lot of Russia's allies. It doesn't mean that we're not right. It just means that uh, there are parts of the world that probably prefer that we don't adjudicate the rest of the world's problems. And so from this, you know, and, and all the while, what has been happening over the last 20 years, right? We've been kind of, every time the economy falls into recession, every time things look like the free market is sending us a message, we've been using monetary policy and our money printer to kind of bail us out uh, of the problem because nobody notices inflation eating away at their savings. It's just this thing that exists in the background. And because nobody notices how money printing widens the inequality gap, people have kind of sniffed around it, but they haven't really figured it out. So it's all kind of happening behind the curtain. And uh, that's what makes it such a brilliant solution for the country, right? They, you know, and what kind of makes it so obvious for people to vote on, you know, it's a bipartisan issue that they're going to vote to eventually raise the debt ceiling like they always do. You know, it's a bipartisan consensus that both parties want the economy to do well and want the stock market to go up. You know, understanding the means by which that happens is a completely different discussion because it's nuanced and it requires critical thinking. And I don't expect that from any of our elected leaders. But that doesn't mean that other countries outside of the U.S. don't understand it and don't understand it well. And based on uh, what we've seen here, and look, central banks around the world also play the game, right? China's central bank plays the game. The ECB plays the game. Uh, And so it's not just the United States. You know, the Bank of Canada plays the game. It's not just the United States that is embarking down this Keynesian path, but certainly it feels like we're doing it in the most reckless way possible. And then when it comes to something like kicking Russia off the SWIFT system and absconding with their uh, with their reserves, uh, it probably sends a message to the rest of the world like, why should we trust the United States? Because as soon as we do something that they disagree with, here's what we're going to do. Now, I'm not saying we're justified or not justified in doing it. I'm trying to objectively look at the game theory of what's happening here. And so now, what do we see? What do we have going on right now? We have either what is, in my opinion, a completely unprecedented set of events that is going to lead us and our country into an epoch the likes of which we've never seen before, or... I just don't have the experience, the wherewithal, the critical thinking, the intelligence to understand that everything's eventually going to be okay. But I can't help but think of things this way. Our nation runs huge trade deficits. We are mired in debt, so much so that nobody ever talks about paying off the principle of the debt. The question is whether or not we can pay off the interest, the cost to service the debt on an ongoing basis. Our failed postmodern overthinking intellectual clusterfuck that became modern monetary theory and these ideas prior to COVID that everything was going to be fine and we could print money ad infinitum without consequences because really there were consequences. We just didn't see them. But the line that was being peddled, hey, it's okay for us to do this. Like, hey, it's okay to be fat is now being exposed for what it really is, which is nonsense. Because we are starting to have to pay the piper. You know, the modern monetary theory myth was always uh, enabled by the fact that 
CPI, which by the way is a rigged number, the variables of which can be controlled by government so it can be adjusted to say whatever it wants. But you know and I know when we go to the grocery store, we know what inflation looks like, right? When I go to the gas pump, I know what inflation looks like. So don't let the CPI number fool you. But the MMT myth was perpetuated by the fact that, hey, despite our best efforts, we just can't seem to generate any inflation. We just can't seem to do it. Inflation is a mystery. It's going down when we thought it would go up. We must have stumbled upon the perfect solution that is going to provide the United States with unlimited wealth and prosperity and the ability to do whatever we want forever, right? You could tell that to a 10-year-old and they would tell you, eh, it sounds a little too good to be true. Probably a mathematical impossibility, uh, to be honest with you. But that's where we were. Now, all of a sudden, that train has derailed off the tracks completely. The COVID painting over the economy, papering over the economy experiment, looked like it worked for two years because the stock market went up. But now we're dealing with the very real reality of it. And the reality is we have out-of-control inflation that is brutalizing the lower and the middle, middle class And we have a Fed that has raised rates to a point where servicing the national debt is teetering on the brink of becoming a huge number that at some point people may look at and say, "Eh, I don't know if they're going to be able to do it. Uh, So far, things have held up because the market has held up. And, uh, you know, the economy, which is a jalopy going down a highway uh, with the muffler hanging on the ground, scraping and shooting up sparks, hasn't yet exploded completely. Uh, But that's pretty much the situation we're in right now. We're the Wagon Queen family truckster uh, after they arrive in Detroit and the guys get to the car and take the fucking hubcaps off and beat the shit out of the car and spray paint the side of it. That's the economy right now. And basically, we're just waiting for that to implode. And the Fed is really doing their best to see to it that that happens. Because we have the quagmire now of... Out of control inflation, which needs to be dealt with by raising rates. Yet we have ungodly amounts of outstanding debt consumer, municipal, corporate, any type of debt, you name it. Throw a dart on the debt dartboard, we've got a lot of it, probably a record amount. All of that debt is going to cost more to service. Individual families and corporations are going to have to tighten their belts, which we're starting to see with layoffs, and they're going to have to spend less. Less spending in the economy means that things will slow down, earnings will come in, and we're going to have a recession. You know, And, and the idea that we're not going to have a recession is insane. If you look at the yield curve right now, it is out of control. And I'm going to pull it up because I want to... Okay, here it is. Twos and tens, 89 basis points. They're inverted right now. As Zero Hedge said the other day, the yield curve is pricing in a second great depression. So the bond market is telling you that the recession is coming, but you don't even need the bond market. You just need to know that we've gone bananas and rates haven't been at 5% uh, in a decade or two. And the last time we went to 2.5%, the market imploded. Uh, It took two years, but eventually the market just sold off, went limit down, and that's that. At uh, this point, we have accelerated the rate hikes quicker than we have by an order of magnitude in years past. And this is why I'm expecting the 18 whaler to crash into the side of the mountain here at some point relatively soon. Uh, all of this will catch up to the economy at some point. It's not a matter of whether or not it will. It's a matter of when it will. And so here we are in this catch 22 where inflation needs to be dealt with. And the only way to deal with it is raising rates. Keeping rates this high is guaranteed. It's a mathematical guarantee to crash the economy. I know people are talking about a soft landing. Those people are talking about the market. They're not talking about economic data. The economic data that's coming in is starting to make things look as though we're in a recession. The layoffs are making things look as though we're in a recession. Consumer debt is making it look as though everybody is tapped out. So, you know, look at that data. Don't look at the stock market. Nonetheless, people on financial news are talking about the idea that, hey, maybe the Fed has just, you know, got the landing gear down and they're just going to ease this baby down onto the runway, to which I say it's just not going to happen. Uh, The real fucking crazy thing is what's going to happen if inflation doesn't keep coming down. Uh, This last CPI number was hotter 
than expected. And so even though the stock market is holding up, which I don't know why it is, but even though it is, um, don't let that fool you. You know, inflation once again exceeded expectations. So the narrative of, you know, coming in under expectations for one, two, three readings in a row, whatever it is, that's now out the window. Um, if inflation is here to stay and we raise rates and we can't stop inflation, uh, then we're going to have a real problem. You know, then we'll have stagflation, which will be uh, a disaster. <clears throat> so in, in essence, could turn out to be another Great Depression at some point uh, in the country. But there's no there's no readily accessible off ramp here. Uh, either inflation is going to stay high and continue to brutalize the lower and middle class, uh, because if the Fed cuts rates, you know, inflation will go crazy. Gold will go to fucking 3000 overnight. I mean, it'll be mayhem. Um, or we can just keep rates up and the Fed will continue on its path to absolutely nuke the economy, which is what will happen. So we have that going on right now. The market is teetering on the brink, I wrote in a recent piece on my blog. Uh, link is in the podcast description, by the way, if you want to read my blog. But uh, I wrote an article called Teetering on the Brink or We're on Thin Ice. I think I wrote both of those, actually, because we are, in fact, teetering on the brink and we are, in fact, on thin ice. You know, if you look at this economy the wrong way right now, if you breathe on this economy the wrong way right now, I think it could collapse. And I think the same could be uh, true for the market, for the stock market. Um, and so we are in a financially precarious position right now that we don't even understand that we're in. Uh, and like most problems that I talk about on this podcast, we won't understand it until it's too late. And at which point we'll be walking around pointing fingers asking how could this have happened. But really we are behind the eight ball almost always, sometimes by six months it seems, sometimes by a year. And not only that, but we continue to tell the public different uh, stories about what's going on that are at odds with reality. I mean, you know, when you see two negative quarters of GDP, which is a definition of recession that we've been using since, you know, Genghis Khan was alive. And then all of a sudden, uh, Jen Psaki comes out and says that's no longer the definition of recession. People are like, OK, OK, it's not a, we're not in a recession. It's like, what do you think? She's uh, wielding uh, the, the Harry Potter wand of economic laws and going back and changing 5,000, 10,000 years of how basic economics work? Of course not. You know, just putting lipstick on a pig, which we can only do so many times. There's only so many variables we can change. There's only so many ways to twist the pretzel of everything's fine when it isn't. Um, and eventually, all those things will run out. And I wrote an article probably last year, I think, uh, called Lying About the Economy is Only Going to Make Things Worse for the Public. Because the more you tell people things are fine the more shocked they're going to be when things aren't. And so at least if you level with people, they will have the opportunity to tighten their belts a little bit and prepare themselves mentally for what is likely going to be an unceremonious next couple of years, uh, in my opinion. At the same time all of this shit is happening, we have China, Russia, and India, and Saudi Arabia actively launching a campaign against the U.S. dollar as global reserve currency. Now, this is something that there's never been a major global push for before, but they have a reason to now, right? Which is these sanctions, we've kicked Russia off the SWIFT system and basically said we're going to alienate them from the global economy. And so everybody else is thinking, well, what if this happens to us? By the way, why don't we stick together? By the way, we've got all the productive capacity. We've got all the oil in Russia's case. And uh, we are stockpiling more and more gold. And so that's, those are countries that appear to be preparing for either a cold war or a hot war. Russia's gone into Ukraine. China is thinking about going into Taiwan. And we continue to see all these little tests, all these little provocations, in my opinion, um, wherein these countries are maybe trying to gauge our resolve. The spy balloons here are the most recent example. You know, we tracked a balloon from Adla from Alaska, went over the continental United States, and we shot it down in the Atlantic Ocean. Now, if you're China and you're using that to gather intelligence, that's an enormous success. Oh, they just let it fly over the country. No problem. But the I think the bigger point here is that tensions are on the rise. 
right? They shot down one of these things over Canada. They, you know, some other fucking shit they shot down over Lake Huron. Who knows what's going on? And by the way, I'm not even getting into all the conspiracy theories about, you know, food factories catching fire and trains derailing and all these other weird little things that are going on. There's not a lot of evidence there to support that those things are, you know, anything other than coincidences. But I'm certainly keeping a fucking eye on those things, too. Because it just feels like something is off. It feels like tension has risen to a level that we are not acknowledging in the way that we should as a country. Maybe, hopefully, our national defense and our intelligence agencies are on the ball. Hopefully. You know, I don't know if they are or not, but I, I, I hope they are. Um, you know, somebody that's great to listen to is Gordon Chang. I would go and uh, YouTube Gordon Chang's most recent appearances and, and get his take on uh, on what China is doing right now. But, you know, certainly, look, Russia's distracted with Ukraine right now. China is, you know, thinking about Taiwan. I think U.S. intelligence has said that they plan on going in and trying to retake Taiwan between 2025 and 2027. Central banks are stockpiling the most gold that they've been stockpiling in recent history. It feels like we are heading to a huge inflection point where the West and the East are going to go in two different directions here. And hopefully this remains a cold war and not a hot war. I mean, it feels like with the technology that we have now, any type of hot war between major, major nations would just basically result in the end of humanity. So hopefully we don't go down that path. But that doesn't mean that tensions aren't going to rise and that, you know, the economy and our relations with China and some of these other nations aren't going to bifurcate further. Um, And so that is the direction that we're heading in, which is why I talk about, you know, if I had to pick uh, stocks that I like, uh, you know, I talk about it on my on my blog. So you can go read Fringe Finance if you want a little bit more on how I'm investing for that situation, because there's certain sectors that I think will do okay. Um, And uh, even if the overall broader market winds up eventually imploding. Um, But all you need to know is the country feels like it's at a tipping point. And I don't want to be pessimistic and I don't want to be a fear monger. I really don't. I can, you know, I can only express how I feel personally. And so, you know, every time somebody says, oh, you're selling fear, I'm just selling my thoughts. You know, maybe I'm just a pessimist. Maybe I'm just paranoid by nature. And hopefully I'm wrong. Hopefully tomorrow... The U.S. and Russia and China sign a peace accord and everybody's happy and the dollar remains global reserve currency for many years to come through my lifetime and, you know, many lifetimes to come. And I really do hope that's the case. But the way that I'm looking at it from the outside in, it just doesn't feel like that's the common sense solution. And it certainly doesn't feel like the waypoints along the way here are pointing us in that direction. You know, with China now finally admitting that they're hoarding more gold than they ever have been. They used to never talk about their gold holdings. And now they're talking about how they're stockpiling gold. And now we have all these little tests. You know, we have the spy balloon flying over the country. Oh, that's interesting. You know, and we have our country in a precarious financial position with leadership that, in my opinion, is not nearly hawkish enough on China as it should be. Certainly, we know everybody's hawkish on Russia, right? We know that everybody's been hawkish on Russia. But with China, it doesn't really seem like that. And I don't know whether that's a product of, you know, left uh, ideology thinking China's our friend or maybe they got the goods on Biden. Who knows? You know, I, I don't really know and I can't speculate. But I don't think we're being hawkish enough with them. Compounding all of these problems, the fact that we've basically become desensitized, lobotomized, obese automatons walking around, bumping into each other, uh, and the idea that the dollar is being challenged and economically we're in this extremely financially precarious position, there's also been a growing problem, uh, a similar type of bifurcation in the media, where legacy media sources are now being cast aside for media sources like myself, alternative media, people on Substack, uh, alternative news, because... Uh, and if really, if you want more on this, listen to Joe Rogan's most recent interview with Matt Taibbi. 
they discuss this in length, and I don't want to regurgitate everything they said. <clears throat> but the key point is that, you know, the media has lied to the country so many times, at least in recent memory, since I've been paying attention, that it's difficult for a large portion of the country to continue to just trust that the media has our best interest in mind and that they're delivering any type of news. So that becomes another type of game theory. Well, when we're told what a spy balloon is going over the country, is that really what's happening? Or did somebody in intelligence tell the media that they wanted to tell us that? And why did they want that to be public? Obviously, when it went public, we would know about it and China would know about it. So China would know that we know. So is it that China knows that we know that we know that China knows that we know that the people know? You know, it's like, all right, well, what the fuck's going on? And who's pulling the strings? We just don't know. But at the end of the day, you know, <clears throat> media can't be trusted and relied upon the same way that it used to be. I mean, we had media scold and censor people when they suggested COVID came from a lab, which it definitely did. We had social media, you know, scold and censor people when they say, uh, you know, that the Hunter Biden laptop was authentic, which we now know that it was. Uh, you know, we had the media go on a three-year campaign to uh, basically say that the president, the sitting president, had colluded with Russia uh, to become some type of Russian puppet as our president, which a special counsel, a bipartisan special counsel, found out was not the truth. Um, so how much more of this are people going to be able to take? And, you know, look, I'm sure there's other examples where people on the right have also lied as well, although nothing is coming to mind right off the bat. But the idea is, like, who's carrying water for who? You know, CNN is sponsored by Pfizer and getting their talking points from the government, probably. So it's like, all right, well, you're hearing the news that's in the best interest of who then? Because it, it certainly doesn't feel like you're hearing it in the best interest, uh, in your best interest. You're hearing it in somebody else's best interest. You know, so why are those things being delivered the way that they were? The, the other stunning thing was Trump's taxes. For three, four years, all we heard even prior to him winning. When are we going to see Trump's taxes? Where are the tax returns? Remember, it was a huge deal. And they were released, you know, like a couple months ago. And now nobody's talking about it anymore. And nobody cares. Would they show? how well, Trump didn't pay a lot of taxes. Well, everybody kind of knew that. Okay. You know, he's dealing with, uh, I guess, some criminal uh, implications from that in the Trump organization. And their CFO, I guess, had, had been indicted. And, um, you know, so that's being dealt with criminally where laws have been broken but certainly it was pushed around as though there was some big huge boogeyman under the sheets and now that the news is out it's like nobody talks about it anymore you know it's like trump and russia collusion nobody talks about it anymore. that's fine because maybe there's no story but what type of credibility loss was there over the three years that people were talking about it non-stop which is why I watch somebody like Adam Schiff, you know, still talking, still harping on these things. And I can't help but think these, these people are just delusional. They're just delusional. Again, sometimes the simple solution is the best solution. You can support transgender rights like I do, but not support having biological men in the same locker room as biological women if they don't want it. You know? That's it. Sometimes it's a very simple solution. You know, sometimes some nuance is necessary. I don't know the answers to all these problems. All I know is I saw the the uh, swimmer from Penn the other day getting off the subway, uh, the one that's been in the news, uh, because she's competing with women. Uh, it's a biological male that's competing with women and, uh, you know, stirred up a bunch of controversy because uh, the women think that it's unfair, and of course it is unfair, uh, that they're all competing together. Which, again, goes to a, a broader kind of point about equality in sports and things like that that maybe is for another podcast. Uh, you know, I, I recognized the swimmer uh, at 34th and Market coming off the subway. Um, I didn't know where I recognized her from, Um but then it hit me after I saw her. But the, the first thing I noticed was she's enormous. She's huge. I'm 6'2", 200. And she is 
huge, taller than me, bigger than me, cock diesel, huge shoulders, just like, just enormous, like male body through and through. Before I realized that I knew her face from somewhere, I, uh, before I even like noticed that it was somebody, oh, I might know who this is. I just noticed them because they were huge. Like, just like you'd be walking down the street and you'd be like, oh man, that dude's jacked. You know, like that guy's a fucking monster. He's huge. And so, <clears throat> you know, she's huge. And so I get it. I, I understand why biological females wouldn't want, you know, somebody who's 6'4", 200 with, you know, male hormones and biological male properties to be competing with them because it's not fair the same reason you wouldn't put a biological male into an octagon with a biological female and have the guy beat the shit out of the woman i mean you know there's a case for equality um in sports and again we could talk about that at some other point but you also have to just use your common sense at some point you know and and so the point i'm trying to make is sometimes we don't need to overthink things You know, with the economy, we don't need to overthink things. With drug use becoming a problem in the country, we don't need to overthink things. With cities and policing, we don't need to overthink things. You know, more police usually means less crime. Can we train police differently? Sure. Are there tragic events that happen involving police and victims? Yes, there are. You know, the the Tyree Nichols thing was a murder, straight up. End of story. A horrifying uh, example. A, a horrifying incident that took place. You know, and those those officers will face the consequences. But just because that occurs doesn't mean that less police is going to mean less crime. You know, you have to unfuck all of the overdoing it when it comes to thinking about these things sometimes. Sometimes to fight crime, you just need more police. You know, sometimes... If you think that taking over Seattle Town Square isn't a big deal, when they show up at your house, it becomes a big deal. And well, what do you want? Well, you want armed security. You want the police to protect you. You know, it's like Mike Tyson says, everybody's got a plan till they get punched in the mouth. Everybody's got a plan to defund the police until somebody rear ends them in their car and, uh, and you know, then tries to run from the scene of the crime. Then all of a sudden, who are you looking for? You're looking for the police. You're looking for help. <clears throat> you know. I'm not Mr. Yay police. I'm not Mr. fucking, uh, you know, authoritarian, uh, m- you know, military style police. I don't want that shit, right? I want police to be of sound and sober mind and, you know, do what they're supposed to do, which is protect and serve. And I appreciate that they do that. You know, I appreciate that they put themselves in harm's way, just like the military, because I'm a coward, okay? I'm not doing it. I'm not joining the fucking Marines. I'm not going to go be a police officer. I'm a, I'm a coward. Okay, so I have a lot of reverence for people that, for whatever reason, uh, do that. Maybe because they have an urge to, you know, to protect. Maybe because they come from a family of police. Maybe because they've been stuffed in their locker in high school and want to prove it to the world that they're somebody. And I know cops like that. You know, pull people over. Let me do license to registration! You know, it's just like, Jesus Christ, fucking calm down. You know, I've dealt with a a, a ton of shitty cops. I've dealt with a ton of great cops. The solution does, just because there's some bad cops doesn't mean the solution is less police equals less less crime. You know, just because MMT has quote unquote worked doesn't mean that, you know, as humans, we've somehow in 30 years figured out a way to rewrite 10,000 years of economic law. And again, we'll find out the hard way, right? Cities are finding out the hard way as crime spikes. The economy is going to find out the hard way when the market tanks. And then it becomes very real for people. You know, sometimes when a virus comes from China, it's not insane to call it the China virus. You know, hey, not much to overthink there. You know, I don't know. Not much to overthink. I love watching female UFC fighters. I love watching jujitsu and I love watching fighting. Love it. You know? Absolutely love it. But you're not going to take, you know, a 150-pound biological male and put him in the cage with a 150-pound biological female. You know, just different traits. It's not, it's not a dig. 
You know, there's a whole world full of female athletes that are a million times more athletic than I have ever been and will ever be in my prime. I routinely get this shit kicked out of me by women at jujitsu. I know women that are black belts that just fucking mangle me when I'm on the mat. I know women that are fucking purple belts and brown belts that mangle me when I'm on the mat. You know, I get it. It's it's not a gender thing. It's just a common sense thing. I would love to have a female president. I would love it. I think females generally think things out better than guys do, to be honest with you. You know, so I would I would vote for a female any day of the week. I just don't think that overthinking all of these problems is going to bring us to the solution. You know, and, and the idea of encouraging drug use, and I'm okay with even legalizing drugs. You know, I'm a libertarian, right? So I'm okay with legalizing drugs, but subsidizing it, that's a different story. Now the wheels are starting to turn backwards instead of forwards, right? And I think for a lot of the nation's problems, there are very common sense solutions that I think most of the country could get behind if they were you know, pitched to them by the right person, by somebody that they trust, by somebody that they look up to. Um, But unfortunately, we have a history of not learning until it's too late. And I think that's what's going to happen on a multitude of these issues. Sometimes when China flies a balloon, it's a preparation for war. I don't know. You know, is there something to overthink there? Are we underthinking it? Are we overthinking it? Sometimes when countries say they're going to challenge the dollar as reserve currency, they're going to challenge the dollar as reserve currency. I don't know. Is it something to overthink? Is there an intellectual solution to that? That, hey, they could never do it. They could never dethrone the dollar, and here's why this, this, and this. Or is there just, you know, a a case for just looking at it simply and saying, hey, you know, maybe we should just act with some humility and some modesty here and, and kind of get the country on its bearings financially And that, of course, would mean that we would need to spend less. And nobody likes doing that because nobody likes delivering the bad news that their budgets are getting cut. But it's the only way out. You know, at some point on the Laffer Curve, we're not going to be able to tax our way to prosperity because people will start to eventually leave the country. We're not going to be able to print our way to prosperity because it's going to cause inflation and it's going to continue to widen the inequality gap. So at some point, spending cuts have to be the issue. Except nobody likes the bad news. Nobody likes the uncomfortable news. This reminds me of Chris Christie at that t- teacher's meeting. Go on YouTube and look up Chris Christie at the uh, teacher's meeting trying to explain the budget cuts to uh, a teacher in New Jersey when he was trying to balance the budget. He's talking about a very simple, very pragmatic cut where they were going from like insane platinum health benefits where everything was covered to like the gold plan, which is the one underneath it. And it was going to help to balance the budget you know, in in the state with very little sacrifice and the teachers just lost their shit over it. You know, if if we want to reach real world pragmatic solutions, especially economically, we have to be willing to tighten our belts, but we're not. We're not willing to eat the carrot and put the Oreo down. We're not willing to under consume and save a little bit more. We're not willing to buy into the belief that you know, maybe we are the uh, leaders of the free world to everybody. Maybe we're not the best in the world to everybody. And this is coming from somebody that's got an American flag tattooed on him, okay? I love the country. Love it. And am grateful and appreciative for the opportunity and everything that it's given me and my family. All of us have worked very hard also. There's nothing that we can do, though. Sometimes the news is bad and we don't have the solution. And to me, it feels like we are fast approaching an inflection point uh, of that sort. And so, you know, not just with the people in our country and not just geopolitically, but economically also. The whole shebang. It just feels like we're heading to a point where something's going to break. And, you know, it doesn't give me any joy to say that. That's why I love when people are like, oh, you love being a fear monger. I don't really. I'd rather just like be talking about how I'm buying stocks because I think they're going to go up because the economy is robust because we have a vibrant economy and free markets and a lot of productivity and trade surpluses. 
but we don't. So I'm not saying that, <laughs> you know, <clears throat> I'd love to say, I love our allies over in China. They've been so good to us, but they haven't been. They're spying on us. They're stealing intellectual property. You know, there's all kinds of weird shit going on. So I can't say that, you know, I guess to some degree, I'm just committed to trying to look at the truth. I don't mind the discomfort because I think it's necessary to get out there. Otherwise, we're not going to be able to act accordingly. Having said all of this, you know, at some point, reality is going to take us by the hair and stuff us face first into the uh, into the truth and into the consequences of what's going on. And there's not going to be anything we can do to avoid it. And that will be the black swan event. That will be the point where everybody wonders how and why it could have all went wrong. Um, and like I said to Larry Lepard last week, you know, nobody sees that in advance. It's always after the fact that people wonder, how come we didn't see this? Uh, and messages like this one will go ignored. But that's okay, you know, because I wanted to get on the record what I thought my state of the union was. And I'll end on an optimistic note which is that it's beautiful outside. I have a lot of great days in the city still, you know, where I walk around and I see all my friends and in my community. And, you know, there's wonderful areas where things are clean and life is good. You know, I, I don't really like our mayor, but that's okay. You know, I haven't been personally shot yet. So I guess that's a positive, right? The market is holding up today at least. So that's a positive. We're not at war right now. So that's a positive. The dollar is still the global reserve currency, despite the fact that Saudi Arabia said at Davos a week or two ago that, you know, the petrodollar is basically dead. But so far, we haven't felt the consequences of that. So it's, you know, it's not all doom and gloom. I have great days, you know, I like seeing the sunrise and the sunset. Love going to jujitsu. I love hanging out with my friends. I love exercising. You know, there's a lot of good out there. And there's a lot of things to be positive and optimistic about. So remember that, you know, just don't be surprised when you wake up one morning and things are different like it was with COVID. Talked about COVID for weeks before the market crashed. We woke up one morning and things were different. There was real panic. People were fighting over toilet paper. You know, those types of incidents and events will happen again. And so either you'll be like me, the crazy guy at the time that had a basement full of masks and mostly liquor that I had stockpiled, <laughs> you know, and ammunition and things like that, where, uh, you know, I felt like, okay, I'm as prepared as I can be, and this is still going to suck. Um, or you can be the deer caught in the headlights. Uh, the decision is yours. It's your choice to decide you know, who's right about the state of the union. Take what everybody else says and take what I say and put it into the Margaritaville brand blender that is your head. Add rum, add vodka, add orange juice, add ice, turn it on high, and see what pours out of the spigot when you're done. How's that for some advice? All right. Hope you guys all have a wonderful, wonderful weekend. Peace.